What's up, everybody? Welcome to Heresy Financial. My name is Joe Brown, and today we are talking about how every single dollar that you hold on to, every dollar you own, is actually a dollar that is being loaned to the government in terms of purchasing power. Every dollar you own is a loan to the government in purchasing power. Don't believe me? Stick around to find out why. Let's dive in. All right, so we are going to look at four proofs that show how what uh, dollars that you hold on to are uh, just uh, they're just loaning purchasing power to the government. And by the way, you can agree or disagree about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing or a necessary thing or not. Now, I'm not here to talk about whether that is uh, you know a net good or a net bad for the economy or the society. We're just going to talk about why it's true. All right, so number one, the number one proof we need to look at is go to the extreme. Go to the extreme of nobody holds on to or accepts or requires or uh, takes dollars ever at all. What does that do to the purchasing power of the dollar? Well, it's, it's zero, right? If you won't accept dollars for your wages, for your labor, you'd rather have, I don't know, the euro or gold or Bitcoin or another form of money. If you won't accept dollars and that is the same of everybody, then the purchasing power is zero because if nobody will accept dollars for their wages. Well, nobody's going to accept dollars for payment for goods and services either, because wages are just, it's the, it's the price of labor, just like the price of bananas or the price of gas. And so if, uh, if, if, if the dollar is not uh, good for acceptance, then its purchasing power is zero. That means that the government can print as many dollars as they want but if nobody accepts them as payment for anything, they can't purchase anything with that. They can't pay the military. They can't pay the electric companies to keep their building lights on. They can't pay the contractors. They can't pay the government officials. No, none of the money that is being printed has any purchasing power. If nobody accepts it or nobody takes it or nobody keeps it. They can assign as many dollars electronically to as many bank accounts as they want, and uh, it has no bearing. It's just zeros and ones on a computer. There's no purchasing power associated with it if nobody accepts it. And if nobody accepts it, there's no purpose to hold on to it either. So that's the first proof that uh, society in general holding on to money, if it's worth holding on to, then you'll also accept it as payment. That is what gives it its purchasing power. And so if that piece goes away overall, then uh, there's no more purchasing power with it. Therefore, the government has no uh, purchasing power, or spending power themselves when they create those dollars out of thin air. OK, and then the second proof, this is a little bit more uh, tangible and a little bit more realistic from a uh, from a mechanics perspective, how owning dollars is actually loaning purchasing power to the government. And that's because what you do with your dollars, where are your dollars stored? Chances are they're not physical cash paper dollars held in your safe or under your mattress. Chances are you get your paycheck electronically deposited and your dollars stay in your bank account until you have to pay somebody uh, with dollars. Well, where, what happens to that money when you pay somebody? Let's say you have to pay your rent or uh, you have to uh, pay your car bill or you have to buy gas. Well, that money leaves your bank account, but where does it go? It goes to the business's bank account. It just leaves from one bank account, goes to another bank account. All right, now what do banks do with those dollars that are sitting in those deposit accounts? Well, they do two things. Number one, they keep some of it on deposit. Number two, they loan some of it out. Well, where does that money go once it's loaned out? If somebody makes a loan to you, well, what are you gonna do with it? You're gonna buy a car, you're gonna buy a house, you're gonna buy your groceries with a credit card. So money that's loaned into existence, is used to make a purchase, but when that money is used to make a purchase, where does it go? It goes into the business's bank account. Now, what do banks do with all of these deposits that are not getting loaned out? They're, they become bank reserves. What are bank reserves used for? The purchase of treasuries. What is a purchase of a treasury? A purchase of a treasury is mechanically loaning money to the United States government. That's what happens when a treasury is purchased. That means that an entity loans dollars to the United States government and uh, accepts a small interest rate and will get those dollars back at maturity or when they sell that bond, that treasury to somebody else. So quite practically, mechanically, any dollars that you actually own are mechanically, actually in true reality, they are purchasing power units loaned to the United States government. All right, so the third proof then that we have to look at is something called the miser fallacy. 
Now this goes hand in hand with the first one that what would happen if nobody holds on to dollars and everybody just dumps them on the market and spends them quickly, then they lose their purchasing power because they lose their value because nobody wants to hold on to them and keep them. So any dollars that are held on to and kept out of circulation, keep the value of money higher. It's a direct uh, supply and demand issue. The more of something there is, the more supply there is of something, the less demand there is for it. Demand, you can also state that its value is worth less, obviously all else being equal. So this is one of the reasons why Japan hasn't seen a massive amount of consumer price inflation over the last few decades, simply because everybody in that society, they're all savers. In most Asian countries, people are very, very, very good savers. They save everything they get. And so that money is kept out of circulation. So this is the this is where I bring up the mi miser fallacy, because a lot of people look at misers and wealth hoarders as uh, being a uh, net drag on society. But actually what they're doing by keeping that wealth, that money out of circulation, they're keeping the value of your dollars higher. Your dollars can purchase a certain amount of stuff right now. And if all of that money from all of the savers flooded into the system because they all started dumping, that would mean there's a lot of money rushing in to buy stuff. And that buying stuff would push the prices of everything up, meaning that your dollars the, wouldn't go as far to purchase things because other things get more expensive. So the value decreases. So the miser fallacy shows that uh, people who ho hoard their wealth and don't spend it and uh, keep their, their money out of circulation, that actually keeps your purchasing power elevated, your purchasing power higher. Because if they all just dumped all their money onto the market all at once, that would cause a lot of inflation to happen, price inflation. So that means that on net, all the dollars kept out of circulation have, have a lifting power on the value of the dollar and that if all dollars suddenly nobody wanted to keep them anymore and just push them into circulation, the purchasing power of the dollar would collapse because nobody wants to hold on to them anymore, get rid of them at all costs, at any cost, no matter what it is, even if I don't need it, it's worth more than a you know, a, 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 you know, a, a paper dollar. Now, the last thing that uh, we need to point out is that uh, holding on to dollars or owning dollars is not the same thing as owning assets. So if, uh, let's say you own the house that you live in, that's not the same thing as holding dollars. In fact, if you have a mortgage on it, technically, mechanically, you are actually short the US dollar. It doesn't matter whether something is priced in dollars. That has no bearing on what we're talking about here. I'm talking about the actual owning of US dollars where you have them in a bank account or you have them under your mattress. I'm not talking about owning stocks. I'm not talking about owning houses with one caveat. There's a difference between an asset that is priced in US dollars and an asset that is pegged to the US dollar. There's a big difference there. A stock is priced in US dollars. So its price can be anything. It can go up theoretically an infinite amount. If the dollar goes low enough, that will push stocks up to an infinite amount. The US dollar has lost 96, 97% of its value since we left the gold standard. It can lose another 99% of its value from here. And then it can lose another 99% of its value from there. And every time that happens, that just means that everything else that is priced in dollars, not pegged to dollars, just priced in dollars, just keeps on getting pushed up. There is no limit. Now that's very different from something that is pegged to the dollar. Something like debt denominated in the US dollar, like a fixed rate mortgage, you owe exactly $400,000. Regardless of what the value of the dollar does, that has no bearing on the number of dollars required to pay off that debt. Meaning that if you own debt, if you own a bond, if you own a treasury, you have loaned money in US dollars, you will get a specific number of US dollars back, regardless of the value of that. And so quite literally owning a treasury is by definition, loaning purchasing power to the government. You're saying, Hey, use my purchasing power. And then when you're done with it, give it back to me. Plus a little bit of interest. It's quite literally the definition of it, but even owning any other form of debt is essentially the same thing because you are long the dollar. And now you understand why we have a system that is built on debt, where our government is so over leveraged and our economy through, you know, the corporations are also over leveraged that any spike in interest rates would cause insolvency to roll across the economy because the system has been built to incentivize that behavior. And if you don't behave that way, you get crushed. So come along, follow us all off the cliff, because if you don't come off the cliff with us, we're going to push you out first.
Now, luckily, there are ways out of the system you can store your wealth in things other than the US dollar, thankfully. Number one, store your wealth in gold, right? Thousands of years, people have been successfully storing their wealth and preserving their purchasing power in gold, regardless of what uh, governments do to uh, their money. So if you'd like to get started with that, you don't have any gold position yet. I really like one gold. Check them out linked in the description below. Number two, you could speculate by buying a little bit of Bitcoin. It's possible Bitcoin is the money of the future. If it becomes money in the future, there's a good uh, asymmetric bet going on there where you can lose everything you put in, but there's a possibility you gain much more. And number three, you can invest in stocks, get rid of dollars by investing in stocks. And if you don't like to be too risky, learn how to hedge, learn how to use some advanced uh, option strategies. I teach an options course. I've got it linked in the description below. As always, really appreciate you guys. You're the best. Have a great day.